Okay, I think you can get started. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Um, I just want to say welcome to Austin Design Week, and we're glad um, to have everyone here for this event. Um, and if you haven't already um, joined, I encourage you to join the Austin Design Week um, Slack workspace. And um, you can check in Zoom, um, um, in the Zoom chat, and we'll be putting that link there um, just as a resource so you can continue the conversation and connect with other people who are, um, who are here for Austin Design Week. Um, and also, we'd like to say a huge thanks to all of the sponsors um, for making Austin Design Week happen this year. This is the first year that we've gone virtual, um, and so we're really excited about it. And um, I'll, finally, at the end of all of this, we'll just send you a brief survey on this event and we'd love to hear, um, it, just to hear your feedback. And so uh, without fur further ado, I'll just hand it over to our host. Sounds good, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome to uh, Austin Design Week's presentation on force majeure. Uh, I'm just gonna jump in and just talk about the schedule really quick, Oops, here we go. Uh, so we're kind of a little late, so we'll, we'll probably have to just run through the competition quickly so we have enough time for uh, our, our winning submissions to present their work adequately. So we'll jump in, talk about what Design Voice is, uh, what the Force Majeure competition was and how it was developed, uh, and the different briefs in the site as well. Uh, after that, we'll jump into a quick video of some of the selected works uh, that, that were part of the submission. We've received over 48 submissions, or received 48 submissions for uh, this competition. So we'll just showcase four of them, showcasing different styles of how people presented their ideas and their knowledge. Uh, then we have Al Godfrey, who's one of our jurors. He'll, he'll join us. He'll talk about uh, what he liked in the winter presentations and kind of his comments on the deliberation process. And then we'll uh, kick things off with Nourish and then go with Tilbury Park. And if we have time after, uh, we'll, we'll do a QA. and a And if you would like, um, I have the chat open window right here. So if you want to add questions or something pops up while you're seeing, uh, while we're presenting, uh, feel free to type it in and we'll try and get you at the end. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Chet, real quick? Yeah, hey, I'm Chet Morgan. Uh, I am a project architect at Perkins & Will and I'm the chair elect for Design Voice. Hi, I'm Viviana Trevino. Um, I'm the chair for Design Voice this year and I'm a designer at Page. Um, and our committee is called Design Voice. So we are under the American Institute of Architects, the Austin chapter, um, and it's a committee here. Um, our main goal is to serve our community through design. Um, so using the skills that architects and any kind of other designer have uh, to give back to the community in different ways. Uh, we have several different kinds of uh, workshops and uh, this year, we kicked off the international design competition that we'll talk about during this session. Um, and we meet every Tuesday, um, last Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. via Zoom. So anyone that's interested in that is welcome to join us. Um, so like Chet mentioned, um, this year was very strange for our committee because of COVID. So we kind of had to reimagine uh, what we were doing this year. And uh, we, in, for to a response for the crisis, um, we decided to launch this competition. Um, we left it open-ended, so it quickly became an international design ideas competition. And we had, like he said, over 48 entries from all over the world. Uh, we had an online forum early in during the process, and we had about 70 folks join us from different parts of the world, which was really, uh, really neat. Um, so we'll go into the different briefs. This year we had um, three different briefs that teams could choose. Um, and what the competition focused on or, um, was about this quote. So it was a response to the COVID crisis that we were going through. So architects facilitate interaction, create gathering places and build communities. What then is the appropriate design response to a health crisis that requires physically separating people? Um, so that was what the, the brief was trying to address. Um, and we'll go into the more specific briefs here in a moment. Mm -hmm. Jump the slide ahead. So this was the site. Uh, it's over 1148 Tillery Street, uh, just adjacent to Airport Boulevard in East Austin. Uh, currently, it's, uh, the, it's the Tillery Street soccer field. So just a big open area um, for that the community uses uh, just as a park. 
Um, a couple of things to note, uh, just for people that aren't familiar with Austin, uh, is Airport Boulevard is adjacent to it to the east, and that's a pretty busy thoroughfare that provides a lot of traffic. Uh, Oak Springs Drive to the north, which is kind of more of a ancillary street, um, and then Goodwin Avenue on the south end and Tillery Street, which uh, just serve uh, to access those neighborhoods. Uh, a couple other site uh, ideas or uh, things that are there are uh, this existing elementary school over in the corner over here. There's a library in the northeast corner. Uh, but the site just had a lot of opportunity to uh, engage community and bring community in while also kind of being uh, on the corner of a, of a busy and uh, easily accessible uh, corner. Uh, and so we felt that like it was the right opportunity to provide, uh, you know, a, an intervention to help with, uh, with designing for the new normal in this area for this community. Uh, as Vivian was saying, we had three different briefs that we used. Uh, initially, when we were kind of creating this competition, we really wanted to focus and bring in uh, boots on the ground members, people that actually are out there helping people. But just given the, how, you know, how crazy this year has been and, and just the fact that we're still in a pandemic, it, it's, we didn't want to take anyone else's time uh, when they're out there helping out uh, people that need it. So uh, that's something that we're going to reiterate for next year's competition. But that's the reason why we have three project briefs. The first one being uh, post pandemic education. And the question for this one is really, you know, what does education, how do we design for education in the new normal? Um, how does, how do we uh, modify or flex if we need to uh, kind of those spaces and how do we keep kids safe and teachers safe as well? Uh, the third one, or sorry, the second one is Project Brief B, uh, which is our urban cleanliness park. Uh, and this is meant to just kind of develop that area as a park and also um, one of the stronger or one of the, the bigger elements as part of this design was to incorporate uh, facilities for people experiencing homelessness um, so they have opportunities to clean and do their laundry uh, and just resources available on site while also serving the community at large for uh, open spaces for you know safe gathering and social distancing and then the third option was uh, project brief c which is the crisis resource uh, community center and this was more about kind of how do we flex for you know if, if this pandemic or this uh, virus is kind of something that ends up becoming like the flu and we see it more often uh, and we need to kind of adapt to it. How do we design a space that can be a, a food bank or, or you know, give out resources? And then when it's not needed, what is it then? And, and how does it address and help the community throughout that? So it becomes a kind of a, a full life, uh, it, it gives back to the community. Uh, so we're gonna jump into video submissions really quick. So uh, these were ones, uh, these were presentations that were uh, submitted, like Vivian was saying, we had 48 submissions uh, out of the three briefs, we, we pretty much had a pretty even spread uh, as far as people um, submitting for them. It was, there was no clear favorite. Uh, and so we're going to talk about uh, Futura, uh, Myriad, Ribbon Park, and John S. Chase Middle School. So let me pull up that video really quick. And the audio might be a little, um, let me see here. Can you guys see that? While, yes. While you're pulling, pulling that up, Chet, um, mm -hmm. just to mention, so these teams were comprised of about four to five um, team members and they could be anywhere. So they didn't necessarily have to be in the same city, which some of the teams took advantage of that and, and did have that as well. Right. And each submission had a board and a video uh, with, the, with the process. Yeah, that was, that was something that was unique about this competition as well is that we, we talked about having like a, a two minute video um, just to kind of introduce the project. And so we're gonna start showing those right now. an opportunity to not only dream up some fun architectural solutions, but also to imagine a whole new world. The world we imagined is a bit bleak. The sky is dusty and the ground is uninhabitable, likely due to destructive human patterns and the inevitable impacts of climate change. As a result, humans have created a new ecosystem, a thousand plus feet in the air, coexisting between the duality of control and organic life.
The transit system plays a major role in how we chose to address our design response to education. Imagine this system as a pre-programmed interconnected circulation track that facilitates the daily schedule of students, staff, and faculty, keeping everyone moving on time and spaced apart at an appropriate distance. We designed a modular tiered seating system that would allow for social distancing. It takes advantage of vertical height and yields larger classroom settings. The most coveted experience with nature is at the uppermost level, which is composed of the conservatories. We've been able to ask questions like, what direction is our society and our city headed in? And how will our current actions shape our future? John S. Chase Middle School protects the well-being of community physically, socially, and environmentally. The design approach for the small middle school in historically Black East Austin is centered on several distinct goals. Our first and most important goal is to create a highly transparent public space which promotes inclusivity, encourages openness, and integrates nature. 
Second, the educational facility operates optimally during a viral pandemic and adapts seamlessly to contemporary educational environments. And third, the simple modular structure maximizes flexibility and allows expansion. Preservation of access and views to natural sites promotes public health and equity in the densifying neighborhood. Elevated wooden walkways connect the school to the street and develop urban links to the landscape. The boardwalks encourage student engagement and provide the necessary space for social distancing. The central strategy of the building's design is to reduce risk of viral spread through natural ventilation. Classroom square footage is duplicated to outdoor capacity creating hybrid learning environments. Shade HVLS stands, operable apertures, and ideal site orientation make outdoor learning possible. When students are confined to indoor learning, distributed HVAC systems place the interior spaces under positive pressure and bring fresh air in. Six classrooms accommodate 20 students each using traditional school scheduling. Modular movable desks facilitate students indoors or out. Students stay at personal stations while instructors rotate teaching spaces. John S. Chase Middle School is named after a prominent Black modernist architect. Chase was the first Black student to attend the University of Texas School of Architecture. Many cherished public buildings were designed by Chase and define the Black East Austin community today. Thanks. So that was just a showcasing of, of four different uh, approaches to showing, uh, you know, the design works. Those were in conjunction with boards that were submitted as well. Uh, but it, it's it's something that uh, I had never done in a, in a competition before, but I like uh, the idea of these video submissions and I feel like they add a lot uh, to the depth of these designs as well. So next we're going to jump into, we have Al Godfrey online, who is one of our uh, jurors. Al, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, Chet. Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm Al Godfrey. I'm um, an architect and planner in Austin with Limbacher and Godfrey Architects. Uh, I would say we're best known as the designers of the boardwalk here in Austin. Uh, I'm also a uh, heavily involved in, um, and both of us really are, the principals are heavily involved in uh, architecture in the public realm in terms of our uh, uh, civic engagement. And for me personally, I'm on the board of the Trail Foundation uh, that has everything to do with the Lady Bird Lake and uh, the Ann and Roy Butler Trail around it. And uh, I think it's that kind of history of public engagement that uh, attracted me to, honestly, it was Ingrid who asked me to join this, uh, this jury. But um, I'm here, the, the only one here representing the jury. So I would just say, and you can see the four uh, jurors on the, on, uh, shown here, and that there really was a, uh, a broad spectrum of points of view where uh, Delia Garza is a politician and comes from a uh, uh, public service uh, positioned by virtue of that uh, political representation. And uh, Beth Wilson is a, uh, a planner with AISD. That's the Austin Independent School District. And of course, everybody knows uh, Connie uh, Rivera as the president of uh, TSA, which is Texas Society of Architects, the, uh, the, the statewide uh, professional organization. We uh, the jury met for an entire day to deliberate on these submissions after having individually reviewed them uh, in the days prior. So it was a very lively and uh, thorough conversation. And I think we gave uh, the body of submissions uh, careful consideration uh, throughout. It was a lovely conversation and it was great to be in the virtual room with these other three jurors, uh, uh, two of whom I'd never met, I don't think. At any rate, um, I'll say a couple of things about the, uh, the uh, jury process. One is that we were delighted to see that the competition had attracted interest from around the globe. You could tell 
by some of the submissions that English was not a first language. And we were delighted by that to think that people uh, uh, had the courage to submit in a language that was not their, their most comfortable perhaps. And uh, uh, we, it was just heartening to see that. Um, I will say a couple things too about the uh, the winning submissions. Would you like me to talk a little bit about that, Chet? Chet? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And uh, focusing specifically on Tillery Park and Nourish, mm -hmm. uh, because I think you're going to see and hear from the winning those teams uh, after this. And uh, in general, uh, on, on Tillery Park, I think we were, and, and I personally was, particularly taken by the clarity of the idea and the clarity of the physical organization of the site. And it, I remember remarking during the jury how uh, it's, it's almost funny to be remarking on a pathway through a site being so powerful, but in this case, it really was true that that is the thing that uh, bound the site to its community and organized the site within itself. And, uh, and it was uh, actually a lovely gesture, as simple as making a path can be. And I think it uh, speaks to the idea that sometimes the simple things are the powerful things. The other big move for this project was to put the uh, community services, tuck them under a green roof so that the site did not become a, uh, a field with a building in the middle of the field, but rather it was a green site and the uh, amenities were there to be found and used, but uh, it was not dominated by the need for those amenities. We thought that was a lovely uh, 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 strategy on the part of the Tillery Park team. Nourish was a different proposition altogether in that uh, nurse sought to uh, uh, establish a clear edge to the community and actually seemed to, by virtue of its, uh, the way it in front of the community and in front of the street, I should say, and by virtue of its uh, the architectural uh, choice, uh, seemed to want to extend the community and knit itself into the community, which was uh, really quite nice we thought, and also we enjoyed the fact that it was uh, somewhat transparent and porous. So while it created a strong edge, it was also something that you could pass through and get to the park beyond. And then further, the fact that it was a modular solution suggested that there could be a lot of flexibility going forward uh, with one element of that particular brief focusing on the idea that the pandemic may not be a permanent thing, but may require uh, flexible responses into the future. So uh, those are a couple of uh, very, very brief observations regarding those two. And as I promised Viviana and Chet, I would keep my comments short so we could hear as much as we could from the, uh, the uh, teams. So back to you, Chet. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Al. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was, it, as you can see from the jurors, they, they were selected specifically um, to, to meet some of these briefs too, or to provide input on what we're designing for as well. Uh, so policy was big and, and education, and, and of course, Al with the Trail Foundation, uh, you know, it, it, it helped a lot uh, and to enrich those conversations in that, uh, in that deliberation. Um, and when it came, to, and Al, you might want to jump in on this, but when it came down to Nourish and Tillery Park, I mean, it was head and head. I mean, these, these projects are really excited to share them with you and have these teams present those because they're, they're really great submissions. And it was really, it, it came down to, you know, the final inches basically. Uh, yes, and, uh, and we were delighted by the outcome and just delighted by the, uh, uh, the, the energy that we found throughout the 48, but these two in particular, in terms of the design energy, the intellectual energy, um, it, was, it was great to see. And uh, we thank these two teams in particular. Um, and would you mind if I took 30 seconds to talk about uh, Futura? 
Uh, if we, Al, if we have time at the end, let's jump on that. that. That's okay, and I can do. I and, and I don't need to say that. Bye. Going on mute. <laughs> All right. All right. So the next one. Uh, so we're going to jump into Nourish then. Uh, so the Nourish team. If you guys want to introduce yourself, and I'll, I'll throw on the video. Um, hi, uh, I'm Van, and uh, I just wanted to say that I'm a Texas native. I'm from Houston, currently based in uh, Brooklyn now. Um, our team is also one of those teams that are that have been based all over the world. Um, JP and Gabby can introduce themselves. Um, but a little bit more about my background. I am uh, an architect and also um, am focused on real estate development as well. Um, hi, I'm Gabby San Roman. Uh, um, I'm from in, uh, originally from Peru. I'm an architect and urban designer. Um, so we are friends and we decided to join this competition together. Hi, I'm Juan Pablo Fuentes and I'm uh, from Lima, Peru as well. Uh, we all met at grad school um, and we really had a, a lot of fun uh, working on this project. I'm currently located in Amsterdam, Netherlands. Cool. All right, I'll jump in the video then. Thank you. Um, so uh, just to give a little bit of background on why we selected this, um, this scenario during the crisis center. Um, two of the things that we noticed during the early days of the pandemic um, were issues regarding um, food distribution. Um, we noticed that there were lots of long lines at food banks. There wasn't a lot of quality in, in terms of the offerings. Um, or enough to go around to um, the areas of need. Um, and secondly, we noticed a severe disruption in the, in the food supply chain um, from producer to consumer. And it affected not only the food industry, but other essential goods industries. Um, so we noticed that there was a severe um, uh, fragility to that system. Um, so it's coincidentally, we wanted to those, so those, um, that fragility impacted local areas significantly, areas like East Austin, um, because the areas that had food insecurity were also impacted um, by um, economic crises, which this health, um, this health crisis has compounded. Um, so our emphasis for creating a platform for, for servicing the community during the crisis times um, was also um, propelled by a need to create something that was a platform for future engagement um, and something that can service the community 
that was both resilient and sustainable. Um, so in, in that case, our projects was um, intended to be a safe and secure way for people to procure goods during the crisis, but also be something that would open up to the community during the post-crisis times, um, which unfortunately we, we don't know when will end, but um, as things evolve, so could our, our site and our project. Um, one of the key things to the design is is the creation of urban space, which um, Gabby can can continue um, the conversation about. Um, yeah, we have like uh, we did a lot of research uh, towards the Austin itself and then Govaje as the neighborhood. So we noticed that we pretty much have a lot of neighborhoods in the two main uh, axes, and we wanted to address that. So we have like an urban edge where it comes intensity, programs, services, so you can have like an urban and that urban starts to degrade to the wilderness that becomes the park. Um, and in this urban edge, we have this, as you may, as they have mentioned it before, this porosity, this uh, idea of the sort of uh, pathways and, and the, the streets that come from the, from the neighborhoods, they can actually go through our building and go through the park, as well as we have like a, uh, um, a sort of a passerelle, a gallery or urban plaza that then becomes just pathways and specific points that are to, through the whole wilderness and restoration of the pond and the spring and just that by topography that area is prone to be flooded most of the time. So we just want to restore this quality of wilderness and that will mean low, uh, low maintenance in terms of how you maintain a park, which is a, an issue for most of the cities to actually have budget for parks. So this urban will eventually produce income that by itself will maintain the community gardens and all the, the pathways and start. Um, and the architectural uh, part will, Pablo will address it. Yes, so uh, we believe our proposal uh, consists a um, value-based proposition for architecture where food equity uh, is right at the center stage. Um, uh, so needless to say, I think it's quite important uh, to have a very strong uh, organization program sequencing uh, so that the, 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 the building is not just a building, but it, it it, it, it acts as, a, as an agent, an urban agent. Um, um, architecturally though, um, if we go into the diagrams to the right, we can see that uh, we've laid out uh, a grid uh, of 12 feet um, upon which we created this CLT wooden frame, um, which is, it is mostly solid on the top, on the roof, um, and we sort of took the longer edge and elevated one of these edges so that we can have greater exposure to the sun. Um, and using the advantage uh, of that inclination to place solar panels so that the, the, the building could be sustainable, um, not use energy. Um, so we arrayed the, the, this unit along Tillery Avenue. And as, um, as Gabby mentioned, we broke up the program so that we were able to have um, breezeways um, uh, that can that and effect, effectively allow the neighborhood to blend into the into the site. Um, um, and I think those were the the larger sort of architectural moves. Um, again, trying to kind of like create a, a degree of porosity and clarity uh, through the architectural materiality of the project, uh, having. Um, glass and uh, polycarbonate as for enclosure. Um, um, that's, that's our proposal. Uh, just to answer one of the questions in the, um, uh, the group chat, the, the idea of using um, city gardening for fresh produce um, are one of the items in one of the elements of, of this project is to source from regional and local networks. Um, we noticed that East Austin, uh, this area of East Austin has existing community gardens and we're proposing to expand that on site and also to source from those, um, the, the local um, gardens as well. 
Thanks, you guys. Um, yeah, I think the openness of the structures and the green green of the site just really allows it to be used for both during the pandemic and after the pandemic. So I think that was a really successful proposition. Um, and just celebrate the space um, within the community that people can gather here. Yeah. Thank you for presenting that. Yeah, it's a great project and we're happy that you guys submitted. Thank you, that's fun working Thank on you. it. All right, we're gonna to jump to the next one, which is gonna be Tillery Park. Do you guys wanna introduce yourselves first and then go in the video or do you want sure. to- Sure. Yeah, so my name is Jessica Arias. Um, uh, apparently, just like Van, I am a native Texan and currently based in Brooklyn. Uh, and my, uh, I currently work as a landscape designer at Matthews Nelson Landscape Architects in New York City. And my partner is Danielle. She'll introduce herself. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Lake. I live in Philadelphia. I am an architect, a planner, urban designer for LRK. Uh, Jessica and I met while we were in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philly. Um, and so while Jess said we, neither of us are Austinites and we're definitely coming to you from the East Coast, we both have roots in Texas and we're very grateful to have been able to join this competition. Um, thank you, Al, for your really constructive comments. It's uh, really wonderful to hear. Uh, that our project was well received and to the nourish team you have such a beautiful and thoughtful prog project so really grateful to be sharing our work alongside yours um so yeah chad if you can share our video this is a little sneak peek into our process it's maybe a little bit less polished than some of the other groups but kind of shows how we have worked through some of our ideas to get to um this outcome all right so the idea is that really there would be um, kind of a, a network that stitches across these other constructed barriers to neighborhoods. And uh, that network would be punctuated by things like this prototypical project, which is the um, uh, Tillery Park, which has um, very specific services for uh, the people who live in that neighborhood. So here it's very close to what's already a state sanctioned homeless encampment. So this provides uh, services for people who don't have a home who live in the, in the neighborhood, but then it's also a gathering place for anybody who wants to use it. Um, so it really includes uh, all Austinites in issues of public health and well being as well this whole site kind of becomes this place that's uh, really good for recreation and wellness and there's walking trails and opportunities to experience nature but then we've added this like layer of productivity on top of it so it becomes a place where there are productive gardens or like agricultural projects that occur at, at that are great assets in the community like when things are stable but when things become super uh, unpredictable or uncertain during a pandemic or a natural disaster like this becomes almost invaluable as a place that's known and trusted it could be an access point for uh, testing or vaccines um, or it's a drop-off or pick-up location for um, a CSA farmer's box or dropping off donations for um, people that are experiencing homelessness, um, this site like really has a lot of flexibility and we've tried to build that into, I think, like our scheme. So this is the board really quick, just so everyone can see the submission and then we'll, uh, the Tillery Park team has a whole presentation, so we'll jump into that. Great, thank you. Um, so Danielle and I met in grad school for city planning and I think we sort of consider our, our mutual approach as being very sort of holistic and we try to sort of, you know, let the complexities of a project come out. Um, and then, you know, building on that, we really enjoy working together because we have this sort of varied expertise so we can each sort of flesh out different aspects of the project. But I think even the way that we approach this project, you know, we really tried to think about um, its function on a, a, so, a social layer, an economic layer, and also environmental. So, of course, the, you know, this site really had a lot of uh, rich history and that site analysis uh, inspired a lot of thought for us. 
So um, on the on the previous slide, actually, I just want to point out um, the pre the previous site of Emancipation Park. Um, because, well, you know, as you know, and we talked about a little bit in our video, a major part of the, the history of segregation in Austin, just like, you know, lots of cities in the United States, is that, uh, you know, it started with housing. So, um, you know, as we sort of talked about in our conversation in the video, the neighborhood has been really purposely isolated or disenfranchised. So this uh, site of Emancipation Park is a bit of a, a case in point. Um, because this uh, actually was the site of Emancipation Park, but then uh, now it's actually the site of Rosewood Courts, which when it was ori originally built was a, a segregated housing project for African Americans. So the way that it was built was by condemning the site of Emancipation Park, which apart from being, you know, a, a, a space that people used in their daily lives, was also um, the site of an annual event that commemorated the abolition of slavery. So this was, you know, um, sort of a double layers of you know, purposeful segregation as a new way of disenfranchising African Americans in Austin. So, and just thinking about, you know, what Tillery Park would do, uh, the idea wasn't exactly to rebuild Emancipation Park, but at the same time, we were thinking about a park that could contribute to integration and that could serve, you know, the needs and the pleasure of the immediate community, but then also serve as a wider attractor. So on the next slide here, um, we just, um, this diagram is sort of bringing all of that together, how we saw the construction of I-35 as being this, uh, you know, historic memory of creating a physical di division between Central Austin and East Austin. And now, you know, the imminent redevelopment of Airport Boulevard in 2020 is um, sort of threatening to have kind of the same effect as, you know, being an isolating physical barrier that would prevent the open flow from east to west. So, you know, of course, that's not only transportation, but it's also about neighborhood development. So we really looked at, you know, this whole area of Austin and envisioned a green space that goes along the Colorado River, um, you know, and all of the streams that um, spring out from that. Um, that that would be um, a network of parks and trails that would sort of weave these separate neighborhoods together. Um, and, you know, their different uses could be sort of hyper local, uh, you know, and focused wherever they are, but then they also move from neighborhood to neighborhood and, you know, it's a, a shared resource across this uh, entire sector of Austin. You're on mute. Sorry, the mute will always get you. <laughs> uh, so uh, talking about the process that we went through as planners and urban designers, you know, Jess is talking about some of the larger forces that surround and impact the site. But then as we zoomed in, we started looking first at how people would be accessing the site and identified a primary approach for folks arriving by transit, uh, primary vehicular access point, and then trail connections that would provide circulation to and from the nearby community college and adjacent elementary school. And, and these major access points, as well as the water feature and, and adjacent uses of the neighborhood started to set up our overall uh, circulation and site organization. Um, and, and because of that, we knew early on that the central building would house the services, the indoor programming, and should certainly be uh, centered on the site. So we looked to a sloping roof that would, you can see in some of these early sketches, uh, which would become the surface for an amphitheater and set up views across the water and provide a point of prospect for the entire site. Um, we also knew that with so much land on the site and in the, in the park, uh, we had an opportunity to take advantage of its fertility. So we allocated large amounts of space for community gardens um, that have the capacity to output large volumes of produce for the surrounding community. And, and we sort of viewed this as not only as an asset during times of stability, but when unexpected disaster or pandemic impacts, supply chains to grocery stores, um, et cetera, a, a productive community garden of this scale could be invaluable. 
So we envision that these agricultural plots could provide sources of income for people um, experiencing housing instability who have come to Tillery Park for other services. So an opportunity to earn a meal or a living wage by working in these gardens while simultaneously coexisting with other members of the community was sort of one small concept that we hoped uh, this site could begin to break down the stigma of homelessness. Um, and, and finally, like a quick note in our, on our initial scheme here in our sketches is uh, we knew early on that we wanted to create some topographic interest on what is generally a completely flat site, but also to take advantage of some sort of shade structure that will collect rainwater to serve the building needs, um, as you can see in some of the sketches on the right hand side. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back to Jess, who's going to talk a little bit more about the circulation and, and points of interest on the site plan. Okay, so this is the site plan and we really thought about all of the different approaches and how you would enter the site um, as being sort of, uh, you know, the primary way for looking at the site. So if you start on the top right, well, first of all, we do have this sort of diagonal path. It's sort of the primary circulation path um, that sort of uh, it runs parallel to this ridge line uh, where the site is and you can see the low point uh, is this uh, retention basin that's um, still there and has become a, a pond and sort of a, a site of attraction on the site. But if you look up at the top right, uh, that entrance there, uh, we were really thinking about as the transit entrance, it, uh, transit entrance, because if you're arriving on bus or light rail from Airport Boulevard, then this is sort of your main entrance. So, you know, you come into this one singular path off of the, the road and you're immediately immersed in this shallow sort of forested area. It's cool and it's shady. You know, the temperature is like great contrast from the, all of the concrete that's around it in the neighborhood. And you're sort of enveloped in this new environment as you follow along this path. And eventually, you know, that path sort of turns the bend and you see an open view of of this landform that is the community center, which is uh, sort of built, you know, centrally in the site and framed by these productive gardens. Um, at the bottom right of the plan uh, is sort of the vehicle entrance, which, um, you know, this sort of cor coral colored area is the largest open flexible space in the park. So for daily use, um, it's probably used as a parking lot where, um, you know, either people who are coming to use the facilities or uh, neighbors who want to drop off donations or people who are coming to use the sports fields, they all come in this direction and park here. Um, but for occasions of special events, uh, this entire space can be used as a flexible plaza for farmers markets, festivals, etc. cetera. Um, on the bottom left, uh, is sort of the trail entrance where, you, again, you're coming into this sort of singular uh, entrance that leads you onto the path that uh, crosses the entire site. Uh, this is the connection to the East Austin Trail, which we showed a diagram on uh, on the previous slides. Um, and again, it sort of leads you around the bend to the central core of the park, which sort of, you know, centralizes the community facilities. And visitors also get easy access to this rehabilitated retention pond, um, which is, you know, a newly refreshed sort of gathering space for picnics and walking paths and other types of recreation. And on the top left, um, you know, you can see the existing site of the Oak Springs School, which now has educational garden plots for students, and it has its own trail connection from, you know, the yard of the school and access to the pond. So there's plenty of space for outdoor classrooms and, uh, you know, outdoor learning and use of the park by uh, school programs. So Danielle will explain some of the more architectural features. Yeah, so for the service buildings itself, um, as you can tell, we have a particular theme with uh, thoughtful uh, circulation through the site and that applies as well to the building itself, um, particularly when it comes to privacy, social distancing and sustainability. Um, we were really thinking carefully about who would be using the building at what times and sort of what are the layers of separation that we need to account for. 
So from the plaza entry, you would enter a large lobby space that has public sinks um, and a place to drop off donations and speak with a community resource liaison as sort of a very public face to the building itself. Um, but if you were to enter on the right hand side from the predominantly pedestrian entry, you could follow the arrows around where it would take you to shower pods and laundry service for folks who are coming to this building specifically for hygiene reasons. Um, and by designing this building to be concrete and surrounded by a mound of earth, we envision lower heating and cooling costs through the seasons, as well as a defensible space that could be a place of refuge for the community in times of natural disaster. Um, and, and the last note here is that we were envisioning that all the plumbing facilities would, would, would return and filter any gray water into the irrigation system for the agricultural plots above. Um, and we were hoping to take advantage of the rainwater that's collected. Um, and if you actually go to the next slide, Chet, um, you can see that the shade structures here would provide another layer of respite from the sun on top of the amphitheater that would also bring water down to serve the plumbing facilities below. Uh, so we're really seeing this as a fully integrated uh, system um, from top to bottom. And then if you go to the next slide, uh, Jess is going to talk a little bit more about uh, the site section here. So this uh, site section is a diagram of the way we imagined that water would work on the site. So if you start all the way over on the left, this is the area that's uh, more connected to the existing school. So it has a large meadow and a connection to the trail system, which provides this sort of serene nature walk experience. But it's also maintaining the soil that's used for water filtration here. Um, which is you know, really the geographic low point of the site and of the neighborhood. So uh, there's also this newly restored riparian buffer that's planted with native uh, Texas shade trees and wildflowers, and it protects this pond uh, as a central water collector on the site. So then across the pond, you see the large picnic shelter um, that has the shade structures that double as uh, receptacles for rainwater. And uh, that rainwater is collected, it's used immediately, but it's also contained in uh, underground reservoirs and used for drinking water, um, as well as the other uh, laundry and shower facilities in the, the community building. So the excess water infiltrates back to the pond and the entire landform of the building um, also has these uh, same receptacles so that the water is collected and it can be used directly to uh, water the gardens and um, uh, on the far end, you also see the, the parking lot plaza, which is a permeable plaza, which can also um, mitigate runoff through swales and through the planted areas and that's sort of the more um, garden scale of park that's around it. So finally, on the next slide, uh, we wanted to show you just sort of a, a vision of the user experience um, on the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we really thought about this uh, entire sort of varied park experience being all banded together by this major path that sweeps across the whole site. So just moving from left to right again, uh, we have this sort of ornamental garden and small gathering area uh, where people can um, do various activities. And, um, you know, and that sort of um, surrounds the more open views um, and recreational spaces that are sort of the larger, more open spaces on the on the site. Um, and then, you know, we sort of have these um, individual um, program areas like the playground and the splash pad um, that are, you know, for specific user groups. And finally, uh, around the pond, we have this sort of passive recreation area um, and a circulation path that guides people through the site. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, so we're kind of running out of time. So we're just going to close things up really quickly. Um, we, so we're putting together uh, a digital publication for the force majeure competition for this year. Um, so we're, we're going to have 20 plus submissions that's going to be included. Um, Tillery Park and Nourish will be a part of that. Um, and so we'll be submitting that should be released uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, also, if you want to look at these boards a little bit more or just more curious about kind of what they've done, if you go to 
uh, aaaustin.com and go to the Design Voice page. Um, you should be able to find the Force Majeure link. Uh, if not, you can Google Force Majeure AA Austin. You'll be able to find um, all of the, the winners uh, that were part of it. And you can look at their boards and their videos more closely. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we will do this again next year. Um, so keep an eye out uh, for Memorial Day of, of 2021 uh, for part or for version two, I guess, of Force Majeure. Um, so we look forward to, to that. Um, and with that, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Viviana, do you want to say anything before we close things out? Um, since we started a little bit late, hopefully we can go slightly late as well. Um, I did want to open it up to questions from the from the audience. If anybody has questions, if you have speaking capabilities, you're welcome to speak or type in the chat. Um, and while we're waiting for that, uh, Design Voice also has another event tomorrow, same time from 12 to 1. Um, it, it's a completely different uh, talk. Um, it's called Within Six Feet. So if you can join us, that'd be awesome too. It's uh, with student, uh, students here in Austin building uh, visitation booths for, for senior living facilities. Yeah, I'm um, totally got to jump off at 105, so I don't, I don't think we'll have time for questions, but feel free to reach out to Viviana uh, or myself. Uh, our information is, is uh, part of this. Uh, if you want to do that, we can uh, distribute those questions to the teams and, and get those answered. So, but I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you to the teams that presented. Uh, Y'all did amazing work. And Al, thank you again for, for joining in and giving us your comments. And I uh, look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.